Hello, everybody. Very, very good morning to one and all. It's always a joy and a privilege to worship together with you and to give God due glory to you as a family of God's people. Hallelujah. And for those who are at home as well viewing, thank you for joining us. And I pray that this truly will be a, a time where we can be mutually encouraged and uh, be excited about the things that God is still doing in this world. Amen. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you for the wonderful way in which you reached out to us while we were still sinners, when you sent Christ to die on the cross for our sins. Enable us this morning to capture a fresh glimpse of who you are and what your purpose for this world and also for our lives so that we may reveal all that you have intended, Lord, and desired through us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I entitled the message, uh, my message this morning, to let the word out. <laughs> it's based uh, on the First Corinthians 1, 18 to 2, verse 5. You know, uh, there is a story of a man who was boasting to his friends uh, that he was the man of the house, he was the boss in the family, you know. And uh, just as he was uh, saying all these things, his wife hollered from behind, are you coming? We are about to go. <laughs> and he meekly replied, yes, dear, yes, dear. <laughs> and uh, so his friends sort of rolled their eyes back and said, well, well, you know, I wonder who's uh, uh, the boss in the family. And he did have the last word after all. It's yes, dear. How about us in terms of our relationship with God? Who do you think has the last word? As we think of how we make our choices, how we make our decisions daily in life, who really has the last word? Well, for starters, we should not expect God to say, yes, dear, to our every whim and fancy. <laughs> he might well say, Oh dear, what is it that you're asking for? <laughs> oh dear, what have you done? You know? And as we think about the subject of Christ and culture, I'd like to suggest that there are just two, way too many fronts and, and battle lines to contend with. Uh, endless points of view uh, and a plethora of worldviews uh, that keep churning out every day. And, and if we're expected to tackle each and every one of them, I can tell you there's no end uh, to this. And I wouldn't for, for, for start pretend to have answers to many, let alone every one of them. Now, some of these issues may actually be rather trivial and less important. Others may be very crucial and, and very important. The regrettable thing perhaps is when the trivial gets addressed much more because they affect us more directly. Whereas the crucial and very important ones just get ignored because perhaps they are just too far away, too distant from us. For instance, if there's something that happened geographically too far away to affect us directly, how do we feel about such things? But think for a moment, in a way, is that not a form of cultural or contextual insensitivity that is dangerous to our spiritual well-being? and that these are things that we should be alert to as well. Take, for instance, the recent news about the fall of Afghanistan into Taliban hands. How has that affected us? How has that affected us? Well, there was even a news opinion piece stating that that has no effect on us. But thereafter, shortly after that, they start to qualify that, well, well, you know, we still have to be careful and alert and so on. And perhaps many of us would not think twice about a country called Afghanistan. Perhaps there may be some who may not even know where Afghanistan is in the world. <laughs> perhaps you may feel too bad, so, so sad. I mean, however, if you happen to also know that Afghanistan has until recently the world's second fastest growing church, perhaps your sentiments may be different. And just for your information, the world's fastest growing church is 
Not Singapore. <laughs> Iran. Wow. Iran. And if you were to think about, you know, the many brothers and sisters who have come to Christ and whether they may even survive the new regime, how would you feel? Perhaps you will begin to take a more prayerful concern about the goings-on in that part of the world. And that's good for our, our spiritual well-being and perspective. So what should we do? Where should we start when we come to the subject of Christ and culture? I'd like to suggest there are three basic things. First of all, know yourself. And secondly, know your enemy, know what you're dealing with. And thirdly, of course, know what to do. I mean, this is basic management. Yeah? But know yourself is important. You know, and when you, when you know where your starting point is, that is fundamental. Knowing your enemy, know exactly what you are ultimately dealing with, that's very important. And of course, knowing what to do. First of all, knowing yourself. Perhaps to help us in our thinking and assessment, when we think of Christ and culture, we should ask where we should begin, where our starting point is. In that light, I would agree with arguably the most influential theologian of the 20th century, Karl Barth, who said, take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both. However, the often omitted part of his quote is that which followed immediately, but interpret newspapers from your Bible. Interpret the goings-on, the events, and all that's going on in this world through the lens of God's word. It is important to understand what is going on, the social, the cultural theories and constructs of this world on the one hand, but it is also vitally important that we know what God's word says on the other and how we understand these things. You know, if we see the world the way that God sees the world, that, I would like to suggest, would be a good place to start, isn't it? So how does God see this world, his world? What is his vision of the world? Well, I'd like to suggest that John 3, 16 to 19 may pretty much reveal or capture this, and allow me to just to read that. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. This, my friends, is God's verdict of the world. This, my friends, is how God sees his world. What about us? How do we see this world? When God looks at this world, he sees that it is in deep spiritual darkness. It is a place that needs God's light. And all the people in this world are spiritually lost from God's point of view. They are all in a bad place. But because he loves the people of the world, he loves us, he seeks to save. And so what did he do? He put in place his plan and set it into motion and he provided the solution through his son to die on the cross for us. How about us? How do we see this world? How do we understand the cultures and the societies around us? And we can see here too that God's vision is not at all limited by national boundaries, racial boundaries, social boundaries, or any form of geographical boundary. And if we share God's worldview, I believe our concern can no longer remain within the limits of our immediate tribe, whatever that, how you define that, our immediate community or nation. I'd like to suggest that it should be global. It should include people from every tribe and tongue and nation 
Because that is what we will see when we get to glory one day. People of every tribe and tongue and nation worshipping the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. It must extend to the ends of the earth. If you are someone who believes that God has a far bigger plan and purpose for this world, you might begin to develop a greater concern for those in other regions of the world. You might begin even to pray and consider how and what the Lord may want to do with you and through your life as part of his plan and purpose to save the world. Hallelujah. Who knows? If you are prepared and you are so cold, the Lord may open the door for you to go to Afghanistan. <laughs> and you may learn, want to learn to speak and, uh, uh, and read the Bible in Dari, for instance, which is one of the main language group there. And uh, you might want to learn how to preach in Dari as well. Uh, and of course, you may also want to add to that Urdu and Pashto and other, other languages. Secondly, know your enemy. Know what you are up against. You know, I would like to suggest that there are a lot of uh, things that we find, ah, this is something we need to tackle, that is something we need to tackle. And some of these may well be what we call straw men that we construct, we raise up, okay, now this is the enemy, then we create this straw man and we knock it down and say, okay, uh, we won. <laughs> but some of these may be very real and these are uh, things that are being proposed and uh, uh, theorized by, by sociologists and so on. And when we look at this whole sea of worldviews that are being advocated, to me it is it's dizzying simply thinking of how we may even begin to engage effectively, let alone meaningfully, with each and every one of them. There are so many views by humanists, evolutionists, scientists, secularists, futurists, academics, politicians, sociologists, psychologists, journalists, and so on. The gist of it, pun intended, is that there is no end to this sea of ideas, philosophies and worldviews that influence and hold sway over the masses through their views of the world, of society, of humanity. So what really is our enemy? Who really is our enemy? What has inspired these views? What is their governing purpose? I would put it to you that most of these ideas have been spawned not by the wisdom of God, but by the wisdom of this world. As such, because God is not in it, they are godless. They do not serve the purposes of God. They are worldly, self-serving. And as I shall explain later in 1 Corinthians 18 onwards, such wisdom does not lead to salvation. Instead, Romans 12 verse 2 tells us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What does that mean? What does that entail? You know, in Egypt, there's a very famous uh, church father called Athanasius. And in the early church days, when they were battling against what is called the Arian or Arian heresy, and that's uh, before, you know, all these uh, uh, things that we, we, today, of course, we study this in uh, theological college and all that. We are not engaged in the battle ourselves. But there was someone called Athanasius, and he was so famous because this bishop stood against the predominant view of his day. And this title, Athanasius Contra Mundum, Athanasius Against the World, was, his, was uh, the so-called epitaph that described this, this man. Now, friends, if we were to unpack Romans 12, verse 2, it says that our thinking needs to be changed. Whatever that has influenced and conditioned our views and shaped our value systems needs to be reined in, needs to be re-examined and brought under God's rule. It needs to be transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Our thinking needs to be renewed, needs to be realigned with God's kingdom values. Sometimes this may require a hard reset and reboot. Thirdly, knowing what to do. In my text today, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to chapter 2, verse 5, 
I like to think that we can actually glean quite a number of insights from the great Apostle Paul when coming to the issue of taking on the cultures or worldviews or philosophies of our day. Paul, as we know, was no lightweight when it came to apologetics or debate. Intellectually, academically, he was well-versed with the different worldviews of his day. That is why he can say to the Jew, I'm a Jew, to the Greek, I'm a Greek. He understood the arguments, he understood their thought forms. He understood the wisdom of the world of his day and age. I don't think he was afraid to go toe to toe with anybody. In fact, we read of his exploits such as that on Mars Hill. Read Acts 17 verses 16 to 34. In his encounter with the learned in the Areopagus, and he did have some measure of success. We are told there were some men, Dionysius, the Aeropagite, and Damaris, and others. Now, this was just before he went to Corinth immediately thereafter. Now, in Corinth, it appears that he took a rather different tack and had greater breakthroughs. He kept preaching the gospel and taught from the scriptures so much so that we read, for instance, in Acts 18, verse 5, when Paul, that Paul was found occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. He was occupied with the word. Acts 18, verse 5. When rejected, he then went to the Gentiles. Acts 18, verse 6. Nonetheless, we see Crispus no less than the ruler of the synagogue himself, together with his entire household, led to faith. Through what? Through the word. Well, Acts 17.34 tells us that there were some in Athens who came to faith. Verse 8 tells us that there were many Corinthians who believed Paul's message and were baptized. Verse 8. In Corinth, Paul even had a vision from the Lord in the night telling him not to be afraid, but to go on speaking and not be silent. The Lord assured him of his presence and his protection. And Paul did so and stayed in Corinth for a relatively long time and pretty much the second longest period of time that he spent in any particular location in all his missionary journeys. And the place that he spent the longest time, do you know where that was? Ephesus. Corinth was next. And he spent altogether one year and six months in that place. And what was he doing there? Teaching the word of God among them. The word. Friends, Paul's confidence was in the power of the gospel. His confidence was in the way God's word works. He knew what God's word can do. He knew he can rely on God's word. After all, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Is it not? Hebrews 4 verse 12. That's what God's word does. So what was Paul's message? What did he preach and teach that resulted in conviction and saw many coming to faith? Well, a passage today tells us something about this. And look, let's look at what it says. It says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews, 
and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Hallelujah. Let us have confidence in the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to speak into the lives of people whom we are trying to share God's love with and reach out to and let the word of God do its work. You know, when I was in Egypt, of course, you visit the the Coptic church there and the Coptic church has had a history of some 2,000 years. And did you know the church was founded by none other than our gospel writer Mark himself, who went down to Alexandria. And while he was there and preaching the gospel, he had to have his sandal repaired. So the cobbler who was repairing his sandal accidentally drove an awl into his own hand. Mark offered to pray for him, and he did accept the prayer, and he was healed. And that was Mark's first convert. And the Coptic church has been going on through the centuries right up to today and continue to do so. And you, you know, when you visit the Coptic church, one of, some of you have been there, and there's this place called the Cave Church or the Zabelin Church, and, and they, you can watch that on YouTube. They conduct healing services. They conduct deliverance services. And it's part and parcel of the gospel message as they preach as they followed uh, what I call Jesus' manifesto in Luke 4, 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to set, uh, to free the captives and op- open the eyes of the blind and so on and so forth and to proclaim the year of the Lord's birth. So they were preaching, healing and delivering. Hallelujah. They don't have to engage in, in any arguments. Just do, preach the gospel, pray for the sick, set captives free. <laughs> I believe what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 2, 5 would help guide us regarding what to do when communicating Christ across cultures or subcultures when confronting worldviews and the like. You know, Paul deliberately juxtaposed what is the foolish message of the cross on one hand with Sophia, the wisdom of the world, the world on the other. And the wisdom that is being referred to by, by Paul uh, of, in, his, in his day and age was uh, that of Stoicism, Epicureanism, Platonism, Aristotelianism, and so on and so forth. And Paul was challenging the notion that through worldly wisdom, man can find God and be saved. Paul explained that on the contrary, the world did not know God through such wisdom. Verse 21. Actually, they ended up with idolatry. Instead, it was only through the foolishness of the message of the cross that one who believes may be saved. 
Paul was explaining it this way, partly in response to the issue of division that had arisen amongst the folks in the Corinthian church. Because there were those who were aligning themselves with the teaching of Apollos. Oh, I, I'm a student of Apollos. Apollos is my teacher. Others with Cephas or Peter. Others with Paul. And they had this mistaken notion that Paul's teaching was a new kind of wisdom, like the Stoics, like the Epicureans. And Apollos was another and Cephas another. And one may even say they began to idolize their respective teachers. And that was why they were arguing, you know, my teacher is better than yours, or mine is better than yours, you know. There's no end to that, right? And they had thought that through wisdom received from their respective guru, they would now have arrived. They believed wrongly that they would no longer experience the vicissitudes of life, the suffering and the pain in this world. Since Christ has already done it all on the cross, it's all paid for, it's all done. Christ has paid for it, we don't have to bear any more of it. And so they believe that they can live a life of heaven on earth, one that is painless, one that is carefree, one that is trouble-free. They had subscribed to the false belief of what is called an over-realized eschatology, an over-realization of what is meant for the last days. You know, someone who, ex who, who holds on to such a belief would seek to experience in the present the fullness of what is meant only for the future. They want to have it good. Who doesn't? They want to have it all. Who doesn't? But they also want to have it now. <laughs> who doesn't? <laughs> As such, the Corinthian Christians did not believe in a future resurrection. Now, sometimes you wonder why Paul thought about resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. That was precisely because to address this mistaken belief, oh, we don't have to wait for the resurrection, now we have this fullness already, what? Yeah? We won't die, we won't fall sick, and so on and so forth. There was no need also for marriage. And so they were living promiscuously and dispensed with marriage. That was why Paul had to write in chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 7, and chapters 5 and 6, to address these issues. And they were urging one another to, you know, uh, express uh, the heavenly setting. Uh, they, they urged one another to speak in tongues. Nothing wrong with speaking in tongues. But they expected everyone to do that because that was the language of angels, the language of heaven. And so in all their discourse and interaction, they just spoke to each other in tongues without interpretation. And, you know, everybody, oh, we're in heaven, on earth now, and... No, let's all just speak in tongues and feel good and we're all in heaven, you know. They have entered, already entered glory and now reign and rule with Christ. Yes, we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. But what we experience is a foretaste of that which is to come. No wonder Paul had to bring them back down to earth when he mockingly said to them in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 8, already you have all you want. Already, you have become rich. Or without us, you have become kings. You have arrived. What Paul is saying, we haven't. And if you read in chapter 4, Paul talks about all the troubles and difficulties they were going through. But you, you know, you have, you have arrived, we haven't. And to this false notion, Paul reminded them in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 to 31, of their calling, of how they were saved. And they were saved not through worldly wisdom, the wisdom of the world, through power or human qualification. The very things that this world exalts and values. But they were not saved by this. They were saved by God himself, who chose the foolishness and weakness of the message of Christ crucified to save. I like to ask the question, are things any much different today? How are people saved? How have we been saved? Through our own cleverness? You know, someone said, it is not what you know that saves you. It is who you know, isn't it? Or rather, who you are known by. Because God knows you. Amen? Amen? God knows each and every one of us. He calls us his children. 
You know, on Hamas Hill, everyone clamored to listen to the latest view or idea by the philosophers, the scholars, the learned, and such like. In Acts 17 verse 21, it describes what the Athenians were always doing. And they always want to listen to the latest. What's the latest theory? Uh, is it critical race theory? Is it woke culture? Is it this and that and the other? There's no end to it, my friends. And we should understand some of these things. There's nothing wrong with studying them to understand them. But we must know that our weapon and to use it wisely and it is to preach the gospel of Christ crucified. Friends, may I commend to you that the best answer and response to the social, cultural isms of this world is to preach the message of the cross. Amen? Amen? Don't have to be very complicated. We don't have to be highly educated, highly intellectual. We can preach the message of Christ crucified. Any one of us can do that. Amen? Even a child can do that. Because we rely on the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't bring conviction. God does the work. We don't bring revelation. The Holy Spirit does that. While these diverse worldviews may appear to have a measure of insight and wisdom with their advocates, adherents, proponents, and following, ultimately they do not lead a person to God or to Christ's salvation. Not unlike the prevailing philosophies Paul had to contend with during his day, we too need to challenge the worldly wisdom of today with a clear and unequivocal message and a veritable presentation of the message of Christ crucified. Amen? You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1 to 5, Verse two, chapter 2, verse 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is what Paul spent all his time doing in Corinth. He wasn't engaging them with all the kinds of uh, different arguments, but he preached the message of Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Friends, brothers and sisters, let us not be ashamed of Christ or the gospel. There's no need to apologize for that because the word of the cross is after all folly to those who are perishing, foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Confidence in the gospel. Again, in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 31, we are reminded that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. As I conclude, may I ask, after all has been said and done in this world, who you think has the last word? Of course, it's not our spouse. <laughs> it's the Lord himself. Friends, when the Lord comes, and he will come again, we will all appear before him to give account. He will judge and reward or deal with each of us according to what we have done. If we have not held back and if we have been faithful to serve the Lord and the gospel at whatever cost, he will commend us and he will reward us. You know, in Spurgeon's 1886 sermon, this is a sermon that's preached about almost 140 years back, eh? Christ and his co-workers. By the way, you know, when we preach, we're supposed to give you fresh bread, not stale bread, let alone petrified bread. But this was what he said to his co-workers, eh? Christ and his co-workers. He said, suppose... Suppose a number of persons were to take it into their heads that they had to defend a lion. How many of you have ever tried to defend a lion? 
Maybe it's your toy lion or something, a <laughs> singer or something like that. But anyway, this is a real lion. Eh? And the full-grown king of beasts, this majestic one. Eh? And there he is in the cage, and here comes all the soldiers of the army to fight for him. Well, Swerdian said, I should suggest to them, if they would not object and feel that it was humbling to them, that they should kindly stand back and open the door and let the lion out. I believe that would be the best way of defending him, for he would take care of himself. And the best apology for the gospel is to let the gospel out. That was what Spurgeon said, and I quote him. The best apology for the gospel is to let the gospel out. With that in mind, let us all the more seize every opportunity to let the word out. Let people encounter the gospel for themselves. You know, in this time of pandemic, or even endemic in due course, let us not become apathetic. Let us not grow cold or afraid or even apologetic. Let us consider and set how we may truly bless our friends and neighbors who have not yet come to faith. You know, we bless them through witnessing and sharing the gospel with them. Let us not be ashamed or afraid to preach the message of Christ crucified. Friends, you remember yesterday we had baptism service in the evening. And at our baptism, if you remember, the charge that was given to each candidate after they come up out of the water. And remember the words that I said? And the words are, fight valiantly under the banner of Christ, against sin, the world, and the devil. And continue his faithful soldier and servant to the end of your life. Fight valiantly under the banner of Christ, against sin, the world, and the devil, and continue his faithful soldier and servant to the end of your life. So brothers and sisters, let us continue to encourage one another and to persevere. Let us preach the gospel without fear or favour or flavour. We don't have to add anything to it. For it is the power of God to all who are being saved. We need to let the word out. Are you prepared to engage the lion? Are you prepared to let the word out? You know, as we close, there's this song which rings uh, in my heart time and time again, wherever I go. And, and this song is called By Faith. You know, God calls us to walk by faith and not by sight, not to rely on our own cleverness, but to trust in Him with all our hearts and not lean on our own understanding, but simply to acknowledge Him in all our ways and he will make our paths straight. There's still work to be done. There's still many, many people who have not yet heard the gospel message or had the opportunity to hear it clearly. And sometimes, unfortunately, for whatever other reasons, it may be clouded by the fact that sometimes we may not be very good examples to them. or We may not have done you know, ourselves uh, uh, any favor by, by not being faithful to the Lord there's no condemnation but I'd like to urge us to reconsider to think of what the gospel has done in our lives and there was a famous missionary Jim Allen who said he became a martyr of course he says he's no fool to give what he cannot keep he's no fool to give what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. So may I urge us to do the things that God has called this church, his church, to do. To go in the power of the Spirit to the lost. There's a verse in verse 4 that says to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. In Margaret Drive, in Dawson, our Jerusalem, so to speak, our Judea, our Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Church, let's rise. We
the Spirit to live and work to His praise and to His glory. And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and all your loved ones near and far this day and always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, bless you.